morning, everybody. Good morning. We're quiet this morning. It's like a tomb in here. We all okay? Or is it just the end of the semester? Like the realization of how much stuff I have to do. Right, right, yeah, that, that existential dread, the the pile on of assignments and things that are due, and teachers trying to catch up when they realize they don't have enough time left in the semester and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It, I've been doing this for 23 years. It still surprises me, right? Like, it's just, it's, it's just so weird. The good news is that it does come to an end, right? The semester must end <laughs> one way or the other. Um, speaking a little bit of which, next week, I am going to start asking you to turn in your quiz sheets. Remember those ancient things we used to do in this class, right? Um, they're not going to be out of 50 points. I didn't give out enough quizzes. I kind of dropped the ball on that. Um, so <clears throat> I'll figure out what that is, but uh, just have your quiz sheets. If you don't already, just have them with you next week. I'll start giving instructions. They're not technically due until the uh, Friday of the last day of classes, but the sooner you get them in, the sooner I can update your grade, the better off you can know what you need to do for the final, that sort of stuff, right? So just uh, keep that in mind and be ready for any instructions I might give there. All right, time to throw a wrench into the works of calorimetry. So the calorimetry we've been doing so far involves changing the temperature of things. This but now, a, what's that? Is this a new chapter? Um, no, it's like it's still chapter twelve, I think. Um, this, this lecture is like a combined chapter twelve and thirteen. We're going to get into the thirteen parts today, and then maybe even move into chapter fourteen. Um, but thank you for asking the question. I. I Never know what the number is, but I'm pretty sure it's 12. Um, so phase change. What, so name a phase of matter. What's a, what's a phase you know? Solid. Solid. Next. Liquid. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, there, there's more than those three. Okay. There's a fourth state of matter, otherwise known as a plasma. A plasma is a gas that consists of only charged particles. Our sun is a plasma. It, 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 it's not a gas, it's not a liquid, it's not a solid. Um, it consists of ionized particles, the result uh, coming from nuclear fusion at its core. Um, so those are the four what we call the classical states of matter. Um, there is a fifth that comes up uh, in quantum mechanics. It's called a Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, you don't need to worry about that at all for this class. Just, just throwing that out there that there can be some very weird things that happen in quantum mechanics. And then, most recently, physicists have been pushing a, uh, what are we up to now? Uh, six state of matter. Um, it sounds way cooler than it actually is. They're called time crystals. And again, it sounds like something straight out of Doctor Who or something, right? Um, what they are is a super specific arrangement of atoms in a crystal uh, in a quantum system. So anyway, um, the, the, the three that we really need to worry about are solids, liquids, and gases. And like, what's the difference between those three? Like, what does it come down to? Uh, density. density, so you can have some liquids that are more dense, as, dense than some solids. So it's not quite density. The, the solids are usually kind of like interlinked. It has to do with how much room the atoms and molecules have to jiggle. Okay? I like to think, so, so this, is, this is generally how all atoms and molecules can move. Right? The physicists have boiled it down to these three states. Okay? An atom can vibrate up and down. Okay? Uh, an atom can rotate around. Okay? And then an atom can translate, can move side to side, up or down, front and back. Right? We call those the, um, uh, shoot, I don't remember the word, the, the three uh, modes, okay? I think is the word that condensed matter physicists use. But basically, three degrees of freedom that, of motion that an, at, that an atom can have. Now, they don't all happen independent of each other. They can all happen simultaneously. 
And when all three are happening, if an atom is vibrating and rotating and translating, and now I'm sorry, you have to watch me dance, that's a, that's a gas. Gases have like all three of those modes of vibration okay, and, and, and movement. Um, in a liquid, there's, there's some translation, but there's mostly vibration and rotation. And then in a solid, the atoms are packed so close together, right, that their, their number of dance moves is limited on the dance floor because there's too many people. Basically, all you can do, right, is, is jiggle up and down. So it, it's that, it's the state of energy and the, and the kinds of energy and the relative amounts of those three forms of energy that really dictate whether something's going to be a solid liquid or gas. We tend to fall back on things like, well, solids are, you know, hard and liquids will, you know, like fill up containers, right? The, and then gases will fill the volume of the container. Those are all handy and they're true and they're useful. Um, but just understanding that these different phases of matter represent different amounts of energy that something can have helps us understand the following picture. And don't worry, it, I mean, it looks scary, but we can get through this, okay? I like to think of this as the stairs of phases, okay? What you're looking at is a graph or a curve, a heating curve, in this case for water, okay? We got temperature on the y-axis, and then we have time. So think of this as taking like an ice cube out of the freezer and putting it in a hot, a, a, on a stove, right? Put a pan, put the ice on the stove, turn the stove on, okay? What this graph is trying to communicate is that before we can do anything, before we change the phase, change that solid water to liquid water, we have to get the ice up to a certain temperature called the melting point. And we know what that melting point is for water, zero degrees Celsius. When we hit zero degrees Celsius, all of the energy, right? Time is going by, but notice, notice how we flatten out here, okay? There's a period of time where even though heat is happening, we're transferring thermal energy into the ice, the ice temperature is not changing. So we can't use MC delta T for this because there's no delta T. Once all the ice melts, then the temperature of the now liquid water will begin to rise. And it will rise until that liquid water becomes 100 degrees Celsius, at which point the temperature stops changing again. Think about that on that package of spaghetti, right? The package directions, you read it, it says boil some water, put your noodles in, and then 10 to 12 minutes later, they're done. Like, how do they know that's how long it takes? What are they banking on or assuming? What's the temperature of boiling water going to be? 100 Always, if it's boiling, the temperature is 100 degrees, right? So this, this fact that energy is going in to the substance, but the temperature is not changing, originally was called latent heat. Latent is an old-fashioned word for hidden. And what scientists of the day, since they didn't really have a concept of atoms, uh, and molecules and things like that, they had this concept of energy. They knew energy was going in, but it was being hidden somewhere. Like the, the material was absorbing the energy in order to change the phase. Once the phase change happened, then the temperature could start increasing. But again, key fact here is that when phases are changing, when we are going from solid to liquid, or liquid to gas, or the other way, gas to liquid, liquid to solid, we have these points where our change in temperature is not sufficient for us to measure what's going on. And it was quantified, right? The amount, the amount of heat required, this, this Q right here, okay, was equal to the mass of the stuff, the more stuff you have, the more energy you need, 
and a constant called the latent heat. The thing is, is that there are different, so, so every material has its own latent heat. And the latent heat changes depending on which step we are on. So on this bottom step down here, okay, between points B and C at the melting point, okay, we are going to have a constant called the latent heat of fusion, L sub F. Now, it might seem weird to talk about fusion. What does fusion mean? Typically, part of something like an atom will like fuse. Like putting, putting together, right? Okay, it means putting together. So in this context, it means that we're like freezing water, okay? Like fusing water molecules together into a, into a solid. Right? So the latent heat of fusion, so-called, is also the same value for, for if we were, we, we are, were melting something. Right? So either, either we're freezing water into a solid or we're taking solid water in the form of ice and melting it and turning it into a liquid. Both that step, that, that lower step down here, okay, the constant associated with that first step is called the latent heat of fusion. So I'll use that term. I'll say latent heat of fusion even though I'm melting ice. Okay? This top step, the, the, the much bigger one up here, okay? this is called the latent heat of vaporization, L sub V. Okay? Um, and it doesn't matter if we are you know, turning water into steam or reversing that and taking steam and turning it into liquid waters. Anybody know what that process is called when we take? Condensation? It's condensation, sublimation slate. <laughs> That's going from um, solid directly into the gas phase without going through the liquid phase. So I'm not saying that vaporization and condensation are the same thing, okay? What I'm saying is, as far as heat is concerned, the same number, the same constant is used whether you're turning liquid water into steam or turning steam back into liquid water. The difference between those two things is the sign that we put on the latent heat. Do you see how it says plus or minus the mass times L? So how do you know whether it's plus or minus, right? The answer is, are you going up the stairs or are you going down the stairs? For example, if we are trying to melt ice, right? Which way are we headed? We're headed up, right? Because ice is colder than water, and water is colder than steam, right? So that's heading up the stairs, right? And so that means we would have a plus M sub L. In other words, it requires energy, requires heat, in order to change those tightly packed uh, water molecules that can only vibrate up and down to get them to start vibrating and rotating. I'm kind of grossly oversimplifying all of this, but you get the idea. And then if I'm boiling water, right, if I've got liquid water and it's changing into steam, I'm still trying to go up the stairs. And so again, I would have a plus times the mass, and, but this time latent heat of vaporization. Whereas before I would have used latent heat of fusion. If we're coming down the stairs, let's say we've got some liquid water, which would be that the center escalator part, right? and we're coming down, we hit this flat, and we're still trying to get down, then I would put a negative sign on that latent heat, okay? Energy needs to be pulled out of the material, right? Because liquid water is bouncing and rotating, and we need to draw that energy down so it's just bouncing now. And that means energy is coming up. So I like to use this picture. This is kind of like my visualization for calorimetry that involves a phase change, right? If we know something is melting, boiling, condensing, or freezing, then we know we've got to keep track of this latent heat. So 
Here's a very scary picture. Again, I would give you any values that you need. You don't need to write these down in your cheat sheet or anything like that, right? It's just a table of constants. But as you can see here, there's materials, okay? They give the boiling points for some reason, right, okay? Melting and boiling. But do you see how the latent heat of fusion changes? So here we've got water, right? Okay, so there's the latent heat of fusion for water. This would be the number that we would use if we were either freezing or melting water. That's all the same step. It all happens at zero degrees Celsius, okay? But then we use a different number right there, okay, for the latent heat of vaporization, right? When, it, when the water is boiling or when we're taking steam and condensing it down into water. Yeah? What are the symbols for heat? He, oh, <laughs> helium, <laughs> it's very hard to liquefy helium. You need to get down to very, very low temperatures, right? It's, it's, it's a footnote, okay? Footnotes right there, okay? Excess of 25 atmospheres. Yeah, helium breaks a lot of, well, it doesn't break a lot of rules, but it's, it's, it's hard to work with. Um, so... Just, just realize, right, that we're going to be either giving you or you might have to go look up and make sure you know, like, which number is which, right? And, and so the decision needs to be made. Is it latent heat of fusion or is it latent heat of vaporization? Again, it's latent heat of fusion if it's melting or solidifying. It's latent heat of vaporization if it's boiling or condensing. So let me do an example of working through something where, you know, we've got a phase change happening. Um, so we've, oh, you know what? I should have just pointed out really quickly. Notice the units of the latent heat of fusion in physics. Joules per, so what do we have to have our masses in? Okay. Some of you had trouble a little bit yesterday with the lab starting. I'm in the bin, not working. I was like, uh, you use grams instead of kilograms. Okay, so we have a known mass of punch, okay? Thermally isolated punch ball just means that we can set things equal to zero again. It's, it's not gonna, we're not gonna lose or gain energy from the outside universe. And then we've got ice, right? And we want to determine the final temperature of the system. That, 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 that's what we're after. So let's see, okay, uh, what we can figure out here. There's, there's actually kind of several approaches here. Um, let, me, let me outline just two of them, okay? Um, one is not better than the others. Just some people are better at sort of turning the crank on the algorithm of, of calorimetry, whereas others need maybe just a little bit more sort of a picture in their brains or something like that. But, but for both of them, I do like to have this, this picture in mind. And I usually, I usually just sketch it really quickly, right? It doesn't, it doesn't need to be exact. It just has to have, for me, the visual hook, right? Of being able to see what's going on, right? Really, really helps me. So I know that the punch starts up here somewhere on this section of the graph. How do I know that? What's the, temp what's the initial temperature of the punch? 20. It's 20 degrees Celsius, right? So that's above the freezing point, but below the boiling point. So it's on, it's on that sort of center upswing part right there, okay? Um, now the ice, where does the ice start? At negative 10, so is that on the flat portion? No, we've gotta be down here somewhere. Again, it doesn't matter exactly where, right? But the ice starts here and the punch starts here. So what's going to happen to the ice when it comes into contact with the punch? It's going to start heating up. It's going to melt, right? What's the punch going to do? It's going to start cooling down, okay? So I can sort of tackle this from uh, what I showed you yesterday where we take up, we take all of those changes in energy and we set them equal to zero, being careful about everything that's happening in the problem, 
Okay. What do I mean by that? So, so what's what's a what's a source of Q here? Uh, you want to start with the ice or the punch? Start with the ice. Okay. So, what does the ice have to do before it can begin to melt? It has to heat up. It can't melt at negative ten. It has to get to zero. So, there's going to be a Q of the ice heating up. I usually like write the symbol and then start writing notes underneath it just to sort of keep track of which energy, which heat I'm talking about. Okay. All right. That covers, right, from negative 10 up to zero degrees Celsius. But what starts happening at zero degrees Celsius? We've got a phase change, right? So now we're going to have Q from the ice melting. And that's, that's going to be our latent heat of, and which constant would I use, fusion or vaporization? Fusion, fusion because we're down on that first, right, we're going up, right? Okay. All right. Is it possible for all of the ice to melt? Sure, right? So once the ice melts, and, and again, I am, I'm kind of crawling my way up this curve right here, right? Okay, I'm going up the stairs on this curve, okay? And I'm trying to see what happens. So once all of the ice melts, assuming that happens, I'm now gonna have liquid water at zero degrees Celsius, and it could increase its temperature. So there's going to be a Q of the ice water, <laughs> right? The ice that is now turned into water going from zero degrees to whatever final temperature this system happens to be at. So, so that's three things, right, that I need to consider. This, this is where, you know, phase changes are a little bit tricky, right? Because the specific heat of ice, the MC delta T from negative 10 to zero is different than the specific heat of liquid water. Liquid water undergoes different temperature changes, has a different thermal inertia than solid water. Okay, so that's just the ice. Okay, what about the punch? The punch starts off uh, in what phase? Liquid at 20. So before we can even consider freezing any of the punch, what has to happen? It has to go from 20 down to zero, doesn't it? So we're going to have Q um, uh, punch, right, going from 20 degrees down to zero degrees. And then sort of the opposite could be true, right? There could be so much ice that we start freezing punch. I mean, it's possible. So you could have another term on there, which is the latent heat of the punch being frozen. But let's assume that this isn't extreme, right? That we're not adding so much ice that we're just going to end up with a solid block. That usually doesn't happen at a party, right? You don't throw ice into the bowl and come back later and see a completely frozen <laughs> bowl of punch, right? Okay, fun party. Okay, fun party. Well, I can do it with liquid nitrogen. Okay, but. Let's leave that out. That would be some sort of extreme weird case. And, and we'll know when we go wrong here, right? Uh, because our, our numbers, will, we'll get like negative masses and things if that were happening. Okay, so what is the ice heating up? What does that Q look like? We're doing a change in temperature, so what am I going to write down? Just MC delta T, right? And I'm, I'm going to write down mass of ice, specific heat of ice, change in temperature, of ice plus and now I've got to do ice melting right this is a phase change so I'm going to write down mass of the ice times the latent heat and I've already know it's fusion but I've got to remember is it plus or minus and how do I know which sign to pick we're going up the stairs so I pick plus. 
And then the ice water, this is gonna be the mass of ice, specific heat of water, right? The ice has melted. The one, uh, the 500 grams of ice has melted. It's now water at zero degrees Celsius. So I've gotta use the specific heat of water times the change in temperature of the ice water. And then finally, the Q for the punch, mass of the punch, specific heat of water, we're assuming the punch is like water, change in temperature of the water. And, and, it, and I, I'm gonna stop here because the rest is gonna be algebra. Inside these two temperatures, okay, the temperature of the ice water and the temperature of the punch, we have their final temperature, which we don't know, minus their initial temperatures. This one would be final minus 20. It starts at 20 and goes down to a final, whereas the ice water goes from zero up to whatever its final temperature is. This change in temperature over here, its final temperature is zero and it starts at negative 10. So the, the unknown thing that we are solving for are these T finals right here. And algebraically, we go off and get that. So, so that's, that's it's like a, an addition to the method that I taught you yesterday where you're just chasing MC delta T's and adding them all up to zero. The nice thing about MC delta T is it, it gives the signs you need in that temperature change as long as you're always doing final minus initial. The problem with latent heat is that you have to pick the sign. Don't forget, if you're writing M times L, stop and think. Which way are you going on the stairs, right? If you're going up the stairs, you've got to have a positive sign. If you're coming down the stairs, you've got to have a negative sign. Yesterday in lab, many of you, some of you, were confused about the signs on things. You're like, Mr. Bela, why is this negative and all that kind of stuff? This is what you were taught in chemistry, and I can almost, with 100% certainty, point out the people that have learned this in chemistry and are carrying over bad habits in the field. Um, and, I, and I know this sounds like I'm telling you that chemists are wrong. They're not wrong. The way they do it is just fine. But I want you to realize why your brain is confused and you're struggling with some of these signs. In chemistry, they will say, I think they set it up as like Q, the things that are giving up their energy or the hot side is equal to, I think, negative Q cold or something like that, okay? I'm getting some nods out there, right? Because chemists think of the energy of moving from hot things into cold things, okay? Um, and so, um, that's fine. Again, there's nothing wrong with this. The problem is, is that when chemists write down the next line, they'll write MC and then they'll do T initial minus T final. And they don't ever warn you that this is not a delta T. Because delta always means what? On this side, they'll write final minus initial, but over here they've introduced a negative sign and flipped the order of their initial and final temperatures because they put a negative sign in it. Like they're trying to capture this some idea here that just <laughs> drives me up the wall. Drives me up the wall. It's an inconsistency in science. And um, I've talked to many chemists and they refuse to change, but that's okay. They can be chemists. Just, I'm just letting you know that sometimes in chemistry, the way they teach it leaves students guessing <laughs> as to what sign they need to put on something. I'm telling you here right now, using the zero equals and just add everything up, there's no guessing required. Just let the final and initial temperatures do what they're gonna do. The signs will work out. The only sign you need to worry about is which one? the latent heat, right? You must, you have to put a sign on that one, okay? And then everything else will work out. Okay, what's a, what's a slightly different method that maybe isn't as overwhelming as keeping track of all of this? We think about the amount of energy required to get things done. In other words, we can calculate how much energy it takes to heat up the ice. That's the mass of the ice times the sig heat of the ice times the change in temperature of the ice. But I know these things, 0.5, uh, specific heat of ice is 2090, 
And then uh, my change in temperature, zero is the final, minus a minus 10. So it's basically kind of like already pre-calculating my first term over there, right? And so I can come along and I say, okay, I know that it's gonna take this much energy. I, I go out and calculate this number, okay? I wouldn't blame you for wanting to do the problem this way because it's got numbers in it, it's got less algebra, right? But that number right there represents the, the energy to heat the ice, right? And then I can calculate how much energy it's going to take to melt the ice. It's going to be the mass of the ice in a latent heat of fusion. So that's, again, 0.5. Why am I writing 0.5? Of, um, in kilograms, right? 3.33 times 10 to the 5 for the latent heat of fusion, okay? This is um, the amount of energy, 166,500 joules, right, to melt ice. So what's the total? Like how much energy is required to get the ice from where it starts to being completely melted? Well, it's going to be the sum of those two numbers, isn't it? So Q ice total, just, just to melt, right? Just to melt all the ice is going to be 176,500 joules. Okay, so that's, I know that's how much energy I need in order to get this ice to melt. How much energy does the punch have to give up? Well, the punch... It's going to be M of the punch, specific heat of water, change in temperature of the punch. Well, the mass of the punch is one kilogram. Specific heat of water, 4,186. And then the change in temperature of my punch. Assuming it gets down to the point where it can start melting the ice, right? Okay, it's got to get down to zero. And then it starts at 20 degrees Celsius. I will get a negative 83,720 joules. So the punch can give up almost 84,000 joules. How much energy do I need to melt all the ice? like 90,000 more or something like that, right? In order to melt all of that up, so can the punch heat the ice up to the point where it starts melting? The punch can give up 83,000, the ice needs 10,450, so yes, right? We can get the ice to come up, the, time the punch will start coming down. But then to melt all of the ice requires way more energy than the punch has to give. So what does that mean for the final temperature of this system? If there's not enough energy to melt all the ice, then we're going to have ice and water together at the same time. What's the only temperature where that can happen? Zero. So the final temperature of the punch will be zero. If we were to solve all of this over here, we would have discovered a negative final temperature, <laughs> okay? And that's, that doesn't make sense, okay? So we would then have to go back and realize, okay, not all of the ice melts, in which case we know, some, we know the final temperature is there. We could even solve, we could use this thing over here on the left to solve for the mass of ice that melts, right? That's how we would find that mass. But, Sometimes you can save yourself a lot of time by doing the stuff on the right first, just doing a check, like calculate the things that you know, see if you've got enough energy to make the phase change happen. If you don't, then the answer is whatever the temperature of the phase change is happening. If you've got enough energy, well, now you kind of have to go over here to the left-hand side, but guess what? You've already calculated most of the things on the left-hand side now, and so you can just keep going. Uh, one. Yeah, right. If there's if there's liquid water, it's going to be that temperature at the bottom. Is that, does that apply here? Uh, it applies for large bodies of water, not 
not punch bowls at parties. <laughs> it's probably zero pretty much throughout. There is some stratification, and so the temperature isn't going to be as cold down there because it is more dense water down there. So um, if we let it sit still for long enough and maintain the ice, it might. It might. Uh, Mario, did you have a question? Why did you use a specific heat of water for the punch? Uh, because uh, they didn't tell me what punch is made out of, so I just, it's mostly water. I mean, unless you're going to that kind of party, in which case it might be spiked. Um, I'm having a hard time understanding kind of the flow of the numbers through this problem. Mm -hmm. When and why did we transition from the left side to the right side? It's just kind of two different ways to attack the problem. This way is more, well, I like to call it algorithmic, right? We're just using what we know about calorimetry and do, introducing the latent heat that causes confusion. Whereas on the right-hand side is more of a conceptual approach. We know we're finding out how much energy we, we've got to work with. And we learned that, well, we don't have enough energy to work with. Could you theoretically solve the algorithmic approach to get it? The same oh yeah, no, they'll get the same answer. Zero degrees. Mm -hmm. Actually, what I, what I said here is that if you solved this, this this algorithmic approach kind of assumes that we sort of melted all the ice because the mass of the ice we would put in the total mass of ice. If you solve this, I think I did that at some point. You get like uh, you get like negative thirty or something like that, right? You get a you get an answer that like we ended up colder than where we started, which is impossible. Okay, which is a dead giveaway that not all of the ice melted. Like our assumption here that 500 grams of ice melts is incorrect. So and again, I can use this line by instead of solving for the final temperature, which came out weird, I could set the final temperature equal to zero and then solve for the mass of ice that gets melted to see how much ice I have left over. So this, the, this, this way on the left, allows you to solve the problem more completely, but the way on the right can save you some time, especially if you get to zero anyway, right? If, if you end up with not enough energy to complete the phase change, then your answer is always the temperature of that phase change. And, and I know, it, it, phase changes can be a little bit confusing. It feels like there's a lot more to kind of keep track of, but uh, just be careful with what you keep track of and you'll be all right. I didn't really understand all the leaves of water. Yeah, yeah, well, with physics, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the point is, is that I can keep repeating myself, but until you, like, do it and try it and see the mistakes that you're failing, right, that, that's, that's where a lot of most of your learning is going to take place, as many of you know. Homework is where the learning takes place. Okay. Um, I'm going to do all of Chapter 13 in about 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> Again, Chapter 13 has got a ton of stuff in it. Yeah, and some calculations you really don't need to do anything in any of the careers that you guys are going into. Um, and so I feel justified in moving through it fairly fast. Chapter 13 is all about Q, like how, how heat actually, or how thermal energy moves between substances. So let's just tackle this just, just conceptually and see where we end up, okay? So this is kind of a funny picture. Um, there are three main methods or mechanisms by which thermal energy can move from one object to another. They are conduction, convection, and radiation. Let's tackle conduction first. We've got a picture here, somebody standing on a floor, and it's kind of like maybe the transition between, say, the, the bathroom floor and the hallway, right? Like one's a tile floor, one's a wood floor. If you have carpet or rugs in your home, uh, you've experienced this. So, so you woke up this morning. It's been a little bit kind of, a little bit chilly in Fresno the last couple of days, right? We we had some of our those 80s and like overnight lows were in the 60s, but now we're back in the 50s. And so the, the house can be a little bit chilly when you wake up, right? So if you're in your bare feet and you're walking on the rug, and then you transition to the kitchen floor, which I'm hoping you don't have rugs in your kitchen because if you do. Problems. Right, okay. So why does the kitchen floor feel colder than the rug, even though they're both at equilibrium? 
Like the temperature of your house is the temperature of your house. Your whole house is that temperature, right? Okay, so even though the floor, right, might be 65, 70 degrees in your house, okay, the kitchen floor, the hard linoleum or tile, feels colder than the rug. I just told you the temperature is the same, but we feel something different. When we say we are hot or we are cold, we're actually not talking about temperature. We are talking about heat. We're talking about thermal energy either getting into us or coming out of us. <clears throat> In the case of the tile floor, which might feel colder than the wood floor, or the tile floor feeling more cold than the carpet, the tile is able to move heat faster out of your body. Your foot hits that floor, energy comes out of your foot into the floor. It's doing it much faster than when you stand on the carpet. In fact, we would say that the carpet insulates. Insulators, insulation, are materials that try to prevent thermal energy transfer. They actively work, or passively work, to prevent the movement of thermal energy from one object to another. Conduction requires that objects come into contact. Conduction is thermal energy transfer when two surfaces come into contact with each other. The rate at which that energy moves, it's a, measure, it's, it's a power measurement, determines whether we humans say it is hot or it is cold. In the summertime in Fresno, you're driving your car around, you got the air conditioning going, it feels nice in the car. You put your hand on the window and the glass feels hot, right? But what's going on there is the temperature outside, right? Energy is flowing into your hand and you say it feels hot. But if you do the same thing in the winter time, when it's cold outside, the heater's on in your car, and you put your hand on the window, it feels cold. Energy is leaving your hand. So our perception of hot and cold is, all, is not about a certain temperature. It's about which way is the energy going. And if you're in contact with something, that's conduction taking place. The next form of energy transfer is called convection. And convection happens when um, thermal energy is transferred by moving molecules from one spot to another. So this does not require touching, but it does require fluid flow. And that fluid flow can be liquids or it can be gases. So the example I'm going to use is the onshore and the offshore breeze, right? Um, water has an incredibly high specific heat. Its thermal inertia is really big. Um, there's a reason that San Francisco, so, so, okay, so let's talk about Fresno first. Here in Fresno, like what's a cold day for us where Fresnans are like, wow, it's cold? Low 60s? 30s. Like, low 60s for Fresno is like, oh, this is nice. Right? We drop into the 30s, though, and we're like, oh, this is a little chilly. Oh, yeah, we, we drop into 30s overnight. We did it this winter. Okay? So, but what's a hot day in Fresno? Like, over 100, right? Okay. You ask somebody from San Francisco what a hot day is. Yeah. If they start going to pieces above 74, right? Like, like it's just, oh, we're dying. Oh, this is the end of the world. It's like 78 degrees, dude. What's going on? Right? And people in San Francisco would say cold is about 50 degrees. So the seasonal change, right, from, from sort of like an average low to an average high in San Francisco is pretty narrow. Like, on almost any given day of the year, if you guessed that San Francisco was about 65 degrees, you'd be right. Summer, winter, it pretty much, I mean, there's, of course, 
some highs and lows and some peaks and global warming and everything that's going on. But in general, there's a very narrow range of temperatures that San Francisco experiences throughout the year. Here in Fresno, we go from freezing to nuclear furnace. Right? Like, like, like we, we will, the, the dog water will freeze overnight in the winter and it will boil in the summer. Right? Like, it's just hot. So, why does Fresno have such a huge swing in temperature from winter to summer, but San Francisco doesn't? It's what? Well, yeah, we're in a valley. San Francisco is where? On a peninsula surrounded on three sides by. Ooh, Fresno's surrounded by dirt. San Francisco's surrounded by water. Water has a huge thermal inertia. Dirt doesn't, <laughs> okay? So when sun shines on San Francisco, where does most of the sun's energy go? Into the water. It's just this huge sink of heat. It just can take a lot of energy and that doesn't leave much energy for burying San Francisco's average temperature. But here in Fresno, surrounded by dirt, okay, the dirt, it, it'll, it can only soak up so much before the air starts heating up after that, right? And so we get these big seasonal variations. And then it's true wherever you see a place with large body of water versus places that don't. And Millerton Lake does not count as large body of water. So, what's going on here? Well, as you can see in both of these pictures, whether it's daytime or nighttime, the temperature of the water stays consistent. Like, it really takes a lot of energy to get the temperature of water to change. But dirt, the air temperature over the dirt, will change from daytime to nighttime. It just doesn't have as much thermal inertia. It's specific heat. It's not as big. So during the day, where the ground is warmer and the water is cooler, the air over the ground will get heated up and it will expand. It'll change its density and it will rise. But the air over the water will sink where it's being cooled off because colder air is denser, denser air goes down. And you end up with this thing called a convection current. The air cooling off over the water will sink down, get pulled onto the land where it will heat up and rise, and it'll come up, cool off over the water, and repeat that cycle, setting up this convection current. And it's called the onshore breeze. If you're standing at the edge of the body of water, looking out at the water, you will feel the air moving off the water onto the land. And it feels kind of good. It's like a cool breeze coming off of that water onto the hotter land. At night, the process reverses. The water ends up being the higher temperature thing. The land is a lower temperature. The air will cool off, sink over the land, get warmed up over the water, rise, and the convection current will go the other way. And we call that the offshore breeze. You'll be standing there looking out at the water, and the air will be coming from behind you, okay? It'll kind of feel a little bit warm coming from behind you and moving off into the thing. I've been in, yeah? Is that how swamp coolers work? No, okay, so swamp coolers, yes and no, okay? Swamp coolers are, um, it is convection, but it's forced convection. I'm gonna talk about that in just a second, because we've got to talk about air conditioners too, okay? So, I've been in situations where I'm standing next to a big body of water and I've got like a campfire going, camping or something like that, and I've watched over the period of like two or three hours the onshore breeze, right, blowing my smoke <laughs> inland, shift to the offshore breeze as this convection current reverses itself, watching my smoke blow that way and then start going straight up to starting to blow that way over the course of several hours. So it happens, again, it happens near any large, even Millerton Lake, this would happen. Um, you get these microclimates and things going on. But the bottom line here is that convection, this is where you have to take some molecules that are hot or cold and move them somewhere else. It can be a natural motion set up by 
the densities of air is changing in various locations, or it can be forced. And this is where we're going to start talking about air conditioning and swamp coolers. Is this similar to like being up in the mountains? Like when it's cooler in the morning, the air is... A little bit. Down. So weather's really complicated. <laughs> but oversimplifying, okay, <laughs> there are breezes that take place upslope and downslope, and they depend on the time of day. Basically, during the day, air is heating up and it's trying to go up mountains, and at night it's cooling off, it cools off more rapidly at the higher elevation as it begins to sink. So yeah, it's, it's similar. But, but and, and convection would be any of that motion that's like cold air is moving into a spot. Right? So how is that different from like barometric pressure? So you can get these things called inversions, <laughs> where, the, where that process flips itself. You end up trapping cold air under like a blanket of warm air. So actually going up the mountains can actually make it be warmer. So yeah, again, weather is weather's pretty complicated. But our air conditioners and our heaters are systems of forced convection. In your house, you probably have some vents, right? The small ones where the air comes out. And somewhere in your house, there's at least one, maybe two, bigger ones that you can probably hear the furnace or the air conditioner behind it or something like that. That's called the return. So air, the blower in the furnace or the air conditioner, either heating or cooling the air, blowing that into the small registers throughout the house, but that air needs to go somewhere. It needs to be pulled back in somewhere. It gets pulled in through that return, that big grate, to get reheated or recooled before it sends out. And so there we're using electricity, a fan, to force that convection current. Have you ever had like the air conditioning and the heater going and like your bedroom door slams, right? You can like, or you're trying to close it and you like, it, something's resisting, you can feel the air sort of moving through the crack of the door. That's because of the forced convection current in your house, right? You got a pressure difference because air is trying to, it's being forced to move through your house. Swamp coolers, um, so air conditioners directly cool the air and remove um, water vapor from the air. Um, we'll talk about why in a second. Or not in a second. We'll talk about it on Tuesday probably. Um, but swamp coolers kind of do the reverse. They don't have an active like cooling system in them. It's got a big fan that's moving a lot of air, but it's, it's moving that air over colder water. And so it's trying to, to cool off the air molecules with that cold water. Like you're trying to get some of the heat of the air to get absorbed into that heat sink of water and then blowing sort of that moisture laden but somewhat cooler air into the room. Swamp coolers become less effective the higher the humidity becomes uh, in an area. So if you've got those like hot, warm, muggy days when you feel kind of sticky, swamp coolers not going to really provide any kind of relief. Um, but if it's a drier humidity, like if it's drier like we have here in Fresno, um, in general, we can, we can take advantage of some swamp cooling. It's just, again, once the water in the swamp cooler becomes the same temperature as the air, there isn't much of a cooling effect. But it does cost a whole lot less uh, electricity to run a swamp cooler than an air conditioner, which is probably why your parents won't let you ever run the air conditioner. Finally, there is radiation. Radiation is the transfer of thermal energy via light, via electromagnetic waves. Um, this is a uh, burner on a stove, like an electric element, and you can see here it's glowing red. But even before it glows red, you can feel the heat coming off of it, can't you? That's because infrared light, light that our eyes can't see by themselves unaided, is the form of light through which heat is transferred. And we can see infrared light if we have like night vision goggles or something like that. That's where, that's where a computer has, is able to see the infrared wavelength and converts it into a wavelength our eyes can see, usually green. Does anybody know why green is used in night vision goggles a lot? Green is the color our eyes are most sensitive to. So we can distinguish a lot more 
variations in the intensity of green than, say, red or blue. Um, there are some night vision goggles that do red to preserve your night vision, but that's a different story. Um, this is the kind of heating that you experience if you've ever held your hands up to a fire. Holding your hands up to a fire is not convection. It's not, it better not be conduction. No touching the fire, okay? It's radiation. When you are sitting there feeling heat coming off of a heater, coming off of a fire, coming off of the stove, that's radiation. Light that's not visible to your eyes is hitting your surfaces, and you're feeling those surfaces heat up because the energy of that light wave is being deposited onto your skin. When you go stand out in the sunshine, what kind of heating is that? Conduction, convection, or radiation? That's radiation, okay? And now physicists use the term radiation to, not, to mean not just the stuff that makes pulp or three-eyed fish, okay? There are radioactive materials, but radiation is a catch-all term for energy transfer via light waves, which are electromagnetic rays, which are everything. Infrared, ultraviolet, radio, gamma, x-ray, visible. There's an entire family that you'll learn about in physics 2B of the electromagnetic spectrum. But for our purposes, radiation means heating something up via infrared light. Whoa! We're going. This is great. This is great. I always like getting ahead. So um, for those who are now keeping track, this is now finally chapter four. <laughs> right? Okay. So um, is, this, is this the second to the last? What, did, uh, did we do chapter 15 already? Uh, no, right? No. Yeah, okay. So this is the se second to the last chapter. You're almost there. You're almost there. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Okay. So... Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about goals. And I know this feels like sort of a, a very rough change, and it is, but this all relates back to thermodynamics. We'll get back to temperature and heating here um, Tuesday. Um, what's a mole? Not math. What's that? Like, okay, well, there's the animal, the mole, the furry bound feature, right? It digs in the dirt. That's not what we're talking about. Yeah, something from chemistry that has something to do with molecular mass. I think, again, chemists have tortured you enough that you're afraid of this thing. The mole is a number. I can never remember. Was it 6.022? Avogadro's number times 10 to the 23 um, somethings. Okay, what do, I, what do I mean by this? One mole. Okay, this, I like to think of this as the chemist's dozen. If I told you I had a dozen eggs, how many eggs do I have? Twelve. How did you know that? Because dozen, the word dozen means twelve. The word mole means 6.022 times 10 to the 23. So if I had a mole of eggs, how many eggs would I have? That many, right? Okay, so that's what a mole is, <laughs> okay? It's, it's, a, it's a word that means a number. If I tell you I have a baker's dozen donuts, how many donuts do I have? 13. 13. Why is baker's dozen 13? Bakers don't know how to count. I heard some of them will like slip in an extra one. <laughs> because the baker taking home a dozen donuts would slip in an extra. Right, for the count. So um, don't be afraid of like the number, right? Now, what kind of number is it? It's a big number, right? This is almost a trillion, trillion something. A trillion is 10 to the 12, okay? Now, it, it can be really hard to conceive of how big this number is. Um, and and let, I'm going to try to help. I'm going to try to help. I'm not sure how successful I'm going to be. But to give you an idea of how big this number is, let's say that I have a, I have a mole's worth of unpopped popcorn kernels. 
right? Little tiny, tiny things of corn, right? Okay. How deep would my pile of unpopped popcorn kernels be if I evenly spread one mole's worth of unpopped popcorn kernels all over the continental United States? Two feet, two inches, two miles. You can reach like the edge of space or something. No, it's about 500 meters thick. Or five football fields. How, how big is a mole? It's really, really big. If I had a mole's worth of dollar bills, and I evenly divided that money amongst every man, woman, and child in the United States, everyone in the United States would be a trillion trillionaire. Elon Musk is a billionaire. A trillionaire is a thousand times more rich than a billionaire, okay? And I'm saying if I divided the moles worth of dollar bills, everyone would be a trillion trillionaire. Well, of course, right, okay. But if I took those same dollar bills and I stacked them up in a pile, right, just, 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 just a vertical stack, one dollar bill after the other, how high would the stack reach? The ozone? The ozone layer? The moon? I think clear the moon. Clear the moon? It's like how far? Uh, Mars? Mars, you could fit like all the planets. Jupiter? Saturn? Uranus? Neptune? I'll say that's Okay. That stock of that, that stack of dollar bills would reach from the Earth to the orbit of the moon and back again thirty thousand times. <laughs> like, like, how big is a mole? It's big. It's impossibly big. Our brains struggle when it comes to understanding truly how big numbers are, even beyond a thousand. Like, like our brains really stop being able. You can't look at something and say, "Oh, it's about a thousand things." And there, people are looking at like way off. Okay. We're good up to hundreds, thousands, and anything after that is a total mixed bag. So for me to sit here and say it's almost a trillion, trillion somethings, there's just really no way to conceive of that. So why even use it? Well, it's because molecules and atoms are really, really small. How many grams of carbon do you need in order to have one mole's worth of carbon atoms? 12. 12. If you look at carbon on the periodic table, its atomic mass is 12. 12.0 12 something something, right? Okay. But we round that to 12. That atomic mass conveniently can be expressed as something called molar mass, where if I have one mole of carbon, I know its weight will be 12 grams. And 12 grams of carbon is just a little tiny pile of carbon. Oxygen. What's the, uh, what's the atomic mass of oxygen? I know it can be hard to see from back there. 16, 15.9994, right? So we round that to 16. How many grams of oxygen do you need in order to have one mole's worth of oxygen atoms? 16 grams. Oxygen doesn't weigh very much. Okay? And that's just a little tiny bit of oxygen. But the oxygen in our air is not that oxygen. The oxygen in our air is what? O2, O2 right? So it's 32 grams of oxygen gas for every moles, for, for, to have one mole of O2 molecules. You see what's going on here? Okay? If I want one mole of uranium, I would need 238 grams of it to 
again, for uranium being a very dense metal, is not very much. I know. I worked with it in graduate school. So the mole, this idea of the chemist does it, is there to help us deal with things that are very, very small, like atoms and molecules. They are so small beyond our way to comprehend them that we try to take some shortcuts into things like molar mass, because we can think about 12 grams of carbon, okay? And we can think maybe about 32 grams of oxygen gas, like we can measure those things on a scale, right? But we can't effectively count every single atom of carbon in our 12 gram sample. So it's, it's a scaling factor and it's a way of talking about, well, I've got a dozen eggs, well, I've got a mole's worth of eggs. It, it's a number, right? A word that represents a number, it's just that that number is really big so that we can deal with things that are really, really small. The reason it's so big is because atoms and molecules are so very, very small. The reason I'm talking about molecular mass and moles is because of something called the ideal gas law. Which, if you get, if you have chemistry, I know you've heard about, and the chemists actually do a really good job of this one, so we're going to mostly agree, well, kind of agree, on what's going on here, okay? The ideal gas law in physics is something that we call an equation of state. It's not politics, it's state in the terms of pressure, volume, and temperature are all things that we can measure about an ideal gas. Now, why is it called the ideal gas law? This is physics, right? We idealize everything. Ideal gases obey rules. And okay, I don't want to really get into the specific rules because they can get a little bit esoteric, but the, an ideal gas functions, it, it's well behaved. I'll, I'll just put it that way, okay? It obeys all the sort of general, we're not going to include friction or intermolecular forces. It's, 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 a, it's idealized in the sense that it just, it does what we say. The cool thing about the ideal gas law is that it actually works for real gases. So like even though we're sort of idealizing things, and they're like the, the ideal gas is always monatomic, meaning that it's only, it's not like oxygen where it comes as a pair, right? Okay. But it turns out that oxygen more or less obeys the ideal gas law. So even though we're using an ideal, it still has predictive power for reality. Where the ideal gas law falls apart is on the extremes. You get too much pressure, too much temperature, or too little, that's where things start to fall apart. The, like oxygen gas liquefies, I think it was at 96 Kelvin or something like that. Uh, nitrogen at 91 Kelvin. Uh, like, like the things will start changing their phase if you get the temperature too low or too high. And so as long as we use the ideal gas law at not extreme situations, we're going to be just fine. And for you, you'll never be in that extreme situation in this class, okay? Um, it requires quantum mechanics and other things. We don't even do that in physics 2B. Um, we, we leave the extreme ends of the, of the uh, topic out of it uh, because it requires graduate school. So... Um, The, uh, I hope you can see which one of these is pressure, P. Which one's volume, V. Which one's temperature? Okay, so that leaves two more things, right? This little sort of lowercase curly script, almost italicized N, this is the number of moles, okay? So one, two, three, 10, 65 moles, whatever it is, okay? It's the number of moles of gas that you have in your system. This R right here is the gas constant, okay? This is the, a number that is true for all gases, ideal gases. In physics, this constant is 8.31 joules per mole times Kelvin. Mole and Kelvin are in the denominator. Those of you who had chemistry, did you ever use this one? You did? No? No, you probably used 0 .082. Yeah, see, some of you have been so traumatized by this, it's like stuck in your brain. 
0.0821 liters times atmospheres all over mole Kelvin. Use both? Good for your chemistry teacher. They should get rid of the liter atmospheres. So, it's, again, it's not that chemists are wrong. They're just using a different unit system. It's a subset of the SI unit system. It's called the CGS system, centimeters per gram seconds. In physics, we use the SI system, which is meters, kilograms, and seconds. In chemistry, they're often talking about volumes in liters, milliliters, that kind of thing. So they're usually dealing with pressures at atmospheric pressure, so it's just very convenient for them. So I can't fault them for wanting to use those units. You poor students are caught in the crossfire, though, because guess what we're going to use in physics? 8.31. But it's 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin, which means that as long as your pressure is in... Keep guessing. You'll get there. Pascals! Remember pressure being measured in pascals? Pascals is the SI unit of pressure. As long as your pressure is in pascals and your volume is in what? Cubic. This needs to be a pascal. This needs to be a cubic meter. And your temperature is in... Be very careful. Kelvin. then 8.31 is the number you want to use. So this is a bit of a shift. We, we did calorimetry, and we were safe in calorimetry to stay in Celsius. That's because Kelvin degrees and Celsius degrees have the same delta. A Kelvin degree and a Celsius degree are the same degree. There's 100 of them between freezing and boiling. And because in calorimetry, we're always taking a change in temperature, it didn't matter if we use Celsius or Kelvin, so we just stuck with Celsius. When it comes to the ideal gas law, do not use Celsius. It will not work. Okay? You must use Kelvin temperature. Pressure, if you're given it in atmospheres, change it to Pascal's. It's the safest way to do it. Some exceptions to that rule, but they're very slight. Okay? Volumes, cubic meters. So you're going to be converting, like atmospheres to Pascal. You're going to be converting liters to cubic meters and things like that. So look up the conversion factors. Make sure you're getting stuff into the right units. There is a variant of the ideal gas law that physicists write down all the time. I, I, I'm sure some chemists do this, but... Physic you know how physicists, we like to do sort of that conservation of energy thing where we compare two points in something and we don't care about what happens in between because it ends up not mattering, right? We've got predictive power, like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. It's like an initial and final states. We do the same thing with the ideal gas law where we can take the pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas at like an initial state and that same ideal gas at some secondary or final state, and those two things are equal to each other because PV is equal to NRT, and if I divide both sides by T, that means PV over T is equal to NR, the number of moles times the gas constant. In physics, we almost never change the amount of gas that we are dealing with. If you're putting gas into or out of the system, you have to use the top one. But if N and R are constant, in other words, not changing, you're not changing the amount of gas you have, all you're doing is changing pressure, volume, and temperature, then the bottom box is true and is often faster to get at what you want to do. I will demonstrate both of these, one where the gas amount of gas is changing, one where it's not on Tuesday. Do have a fantastic weekend, homework to do on Saturday, and um, we will strive forward next week with some more thermodynamics.